Well, hello and happy Monday, everyone. Welcome to another episode of You Got the Power. I'm your host, Dr. Jason Deitch, and of course, we are here with the Chief Medical Officer of the Centeno Schultz Clinic, Dr. Chris Centeno. Dr. Centeno, good afternoon. Good afternoon. We are uh, continuing our topics around cranial cervical instability. You just did uh, a first, another first, I should say, besides inventing the procedure over a decade ago, you've now done really the first symptom survey uh, from people or with people uh, that are suffering from cranial cervical instability. Let's, uh, let's start off today's episode with what that study is all about. I'm going to post a link down below to what we're referring to. So thank you for joining us, Dr. Centeno. What are the most popular symptoms people are experiencing when they are diagnosed with cranial cervical instability? Yeah, so we have been uh, looking at lots of things, collecting lots of data from our patients, uh, moving towards getting our first retrospective case series out on how patients are responding to this PICL procedure. But in the process of doing that, we had patients fill out symptom questionnaires who are already uh, gone through our uh, screening process for having craniocervical instability. And that's because there really isn't much out there. You can see a bunch of texts written by people and they'll give you their opinions. Um, and many of those texts or other studies are really on people with catastrophic instability, meaning upper cervical fractures. So for this group, there isn't a lot out there of a, in, in the way of a formal report of how often specific symptoms are reported. So we created a word cloud uh, which will be uh, in the document uh, that is that are in the comments here, so that you can go ahead and, and click on that and see what the word cloud looks like. A word cloud, just so that you remember, if the word is used more often, uh, then the word is bigger. If it's used less often, then the word is smaller. So it gives you not only a sense of what some of the main symptoms are, headache, dizziness, uh, things like that, but also what are some of the less common symptoms that people tend to report uh, that may or may not be associated by most doctors with CCI. Um, so that's what that is. Well, let's uh, let's get into it. Uh, let's start with some of these, you know, as you say, big words. I see headache, dizziness, lightheaded, uh, being by far the largest. Uh, let, let's talk about the ones that most people experience most of the time. Yeah. So if you look at headache, uh, that one's pretty obvious because this is an injury to the uh, high upper cervical spine and all three high upper cervical joints, C0, C1, C1, C2, C2, 3, refer pain to the head. You've got nerves at the back of the head that can get irritated, the occipital nerves, nerves up front here that can get irritated, the super, superficial cervical plexus and cause headache. So headache makes sense. Um, dizziness and balance is usually because you're getting bad information from the upper cervical joints as to uh, the position of the head, because they're injured, uh, relative to what the inner ear and the eyes are telling the body. So all three of those things have to agree. And when they don't agree, you can get dizzy, have lightheadedness, or feel uh, like you're off balance. So those are those two, and, and what explains those two? Well, if you're watching, I guess my question for you is, which of these symptoms have you experienced? Have you noticed that you've got one of them, two of them, or a whole cluster of different words? Uh, and as we're waiting for people to comment and to ask questions, Doc, I'll ask you again, are there any words on here that you were surprised to see or any of maybe the smaller ones? There's the most obvious ones, but are there any that you know you, you didn't even expect to be on there? Yeah, I was surprised at how often shoulder pain and uh, thoracic pain were reported. Now, I shouldn't be because I see a lot of CCI patients with shoulder issues, uh, but I didn't think it would be this many. Uh, and uh, lumbar pain, again, we see that quite a bit with CCI. That one makes a little more sense to me. Um, speech issues, that one I was a little bit surprised by because I don't see that many people with speech issues, but again, you know, they may have them and just not be discussing them because there's other symptoms they have that are, that are bigger in their, their, their perception at that point. Uh, we see a lot of blurry vision, um, a lot of sleep problems, obviously a lot of tachycardia. Um, 
and a lot of POTS type symptoms. Uh, chest pain is another one on there that I was a little surprised about. Again, I've seen some patients with chest pain, but uh, again, it just may be that that's like fifth or sixth or seventh down on their list, and hence they're not really they're not really talking about it. They're going for the top three or four or five. How do you want people to uh, kind of use this information, the value of it? I, I obviously, uh, you know, CCI, just having these symptoms doesn't mean you have CCI. Uh, there's more to the diagnosis, more to the story. Um, what is the value for people to see this? Does this sort of go, okay, I have this diagnosis, I have these symptoms, therefore I can maybe assume that maybe things like speech issues or, uh, you know, allodynia or something, or chest pain or things like that. Is, is it to verify and validate that there are a variety of different symptoms that are connected to that and that it may be all part of one thing? Or what, what, what's, what's the most value that people can get from seeing this list? Yeah, getting to a diagnosis is always a journey. And I think the biggest problem is that physicians often use symptoms to drive which road they're going to go down on the diagnostic process. And so knowing what symptoms are associated with a disorder is critical, right? Because if you don't, if you're not hundred percent sure, then you're going to go down the wrong diagnostic road, waste a lot of time, resources, energy, and money, which happens a lot in CCI. Many of these patients have bounced around from specialist to specialist to specialist who really didn't have a box in which to put what was wrong with them. And so having a symptom map at least allows you to start thinking about this. So for instance, if you look at the biggest ones here, um, headache, dizziness, lightheadedness, numbness and tingling, neck pain. Um, so that could certainly be other things for sure. It could just be someone who's got a lower neck issue um, on top of an upper neck injury. But if that allows you at least to put in your differential diagnosis that this person may have craniocervical instability, that's incredibly uh, important and helpful for the doctor, because at least now they're heading down the wrong, they're heading down the right direction. You know, all too often, for example, you know, these patients will go in and see a neurologist and say, "I've got headaches." Next thing you know, they're being placed on migraine medications. They're going down completely the wrong path, or the dizziness. They go see an ENT doctor who's working them up for an inner ear issue. All the tests come back, no, no inner ear issue. Um, and so that's usually how it goes. So if we can help physicians and patients to say, ha, huh, I've got this complex of symptoms that looks a lot like this. Maybe my doctor doesn't understand it, but I can do some research on my own and at least suggest it to my doctor as a possible, then you know, hopefully I can steer the diagnostic testing down a route that makes sense. Or if that doctor just says, hey, I'm not comfortable with that at all, maybe he can get to me to someone who is. I hope people watching are really understanding uh, the importance of this word cloud. And I mean that because uh, just to reiterate what you just said and, and my experience as well, is that there's so many doctors that focus sort of on the really specific part of their lane only. And the reality is the body works together as an entire system. So it would seem very uh, unobvious that, for example, I see frequent urination I can't imagine most people would associate an upper cervical problem with yeah. frequent urination. So, so there's a validation to understand and, and sort of, I think, helps people to realize that, again, the brain goes through the spine. It goes through the hole in the middle, the spinal canal. Uh, and when you have that kind of instability, there's so much innervation between the mind and body. It's literally the tunnel that everything has to pass through. Everything that happens down here has to pass through that tunnel. So instability there, as you can see, can really create lots of effects that can become clusters of this condition. Super valuable to see how they can all work together. And, and the value is understanding, wow, it might all just be coming from right here. Does that sound right, Doc? Yeah. Um, and again, I think it's just a way to try to start that diagnostic process down the right road, because if you head down the wrong road initially and you get too far down that road, it can really not only waste everyone's time, but it can be incredibly expensive. Um, and even with insurance, it can be incredibly expensive. You know, I've seen patients who are tapped out financially 
because their insurance, you know, for three years straight has been used for the million dollar workup. And they had some percentage of that million dollar workup they had to pay for um, simply because one of these symptoms were taken in isolation and then a diagnostic routine launched based on one of them. Um, so the folks didn't really that were seeing them didn't really understand that there were other symptoms they should be looking for as well. Super valuable. That is uh, an essential part. And again, I'm just going to reiterate, that is why it is so important to work with a doctor that you know you can trust. That is different than the one who is on my insurance list. That is different than the one that's most close and convenient to you. Someone who is an expert in this case, who has literally, literally led the field in this uh, orthobiologics, specifically around cervical cranial instability. Your health needs to be your number one priority and taking shortcuts, discounts and conveniences is oftentimes not what's in your long term best interest. Doc, we're getting questions, so let's head on over. Let's start with a uh, question submitted in advance by Marabella Khan. Hi, Marabella. Uh, do you treat international patients and uh, is there a way to set up an appointment to speak with you before we set up an appointment for the procedure? How do people internationally work with you, Doc? Yeah, so that's very common. So what will happen is we'll get on a telemedicine hookup over Zoom and uh, we'll go through the patient's imaging, history, uh, ask any additional questions that we need to and try to get to a diagnosis or at least is what we do likely going to help or not help uh, before the patient comes over here. So that might be, hey, we need more imaging than we have. Let's get this and this. Or that might be, you are right now a candidate, so let's talk about what that looks like. So yes, we treat lots of international patients uh, and uh, usually not an issue at all um, for us to connect with them and see what's going on. All right, that sounds to me like uh, contacting the Centeno Schultz Clinic and working with the Education Center who can schedule a telehealth appointment with you to work and speak with directly with Dr. Centeno. Uh, let's talk. Yep. Let's, uh, Naomi, thank you for sharing, Naomi. And sharing your symptoms does help other people go, that's like me. I got that too. Or you may actually sort of share something that may not be on our word cloud that many of us go, wow, we didn't know that. That was interesting. So Naomi's sharing. Uh, she's got a speech issues, blurred vision, dizziness. That all makes some sense. Again, shoulders, arms. Some people may go, but it's my neck, not my shoulder, not my arm. That's important because it's all connected. You look at the skeleton, you look at the nerves that come out of the skeleton. That's what we're working with and talking about. Naomi, thank you for sharing that. Our friend Rachel Riggs is uh, saying hello. Rachel, thank you for saying hi. Uh, Jaden Langford asks, do you categorize CCI by severity, such as mild, moderate, et cetera? What factors are used to determine diagnosis severity? And does the severity change how you recommend and approach treatment? Yeah, so when it comes to severity, we could look at lots of different things, right? One would be the severity of the instability. Uh, and uh, to do that, we use a digital motion X-ray commonly, or sometimes flexion extension uh, MRI. And uh, the problem so far is that when I started doing this work many years ago, my assumption was that the, the more severe amounts of instability wouldn't respond, the less uh, severe amounts of instability or, or less instability would respond. And it really didn't turn out that way, uh, that the most severely unstable patients uh, weren't responding. So that was kind of scrapped uh, as a way to, to look at patients and whether or not they were a candidate. Um, then you can also look at uh, severity from the standpoint of how things are positioned. Um, that's a difficult one to do because many of the metrics used to diagnose CCI really come from the world of uh, different conditions, uh, things like uh, fractures in the upper neck, for example. Uh, so they're not really focused in this area of trying to diagnose people who have, um, don't have fractures, but have ligament issues and, and symptoms. So that's generally how we'll look at severity. Um, I'm not as concerned about how things are positioned on a static MRI because this is a, a, a movement-based diagnosis, craniocervical instability. 
means that there's instability, right? And that's a movement-based concept. So that's got to be diagnosed on movement-based imaging, not on a static MRI where we measure the angle of the dangle and the squiggle of the wiggle. You know, the angle of the dangle and the squiggle of the wiggle on the MRI, things like grab oaks, powers ratios, clavoaxial angle, that's all another great piece of information to have, but by itself, is, nothing is diagnostic. It's all a picture of the history, the, the imaging, uh, the patient's response to treatment, uh, and their physical exam is all put together to create uh, a diagnosis. One thing by itself isn't all that important unless it's supported by other things. Got to work together as a package. And you do personalize your treatment and recommendations very much based on somebody's history, their uh, severity, uh, and I guess their ambitions and where they are. Is that That's part of what they get when they work with you is the procedure as well as the supportive care and recommendations they need as well, whether that's supplementation or movement exercises, working with other professionals, you mentioned upper cervical chiropractors sometimes and so on. Uh, yes. That is that is part of quote, the, the treatment uh, and is personalized based on each individual's uh, condition, severity, et cetera. Is that accurate? Correct, yeah, there's, there's, there isn't one set treatment that every patient gets. It depends on what's wrong with that person. For instance, early on in the disease, you could probably just treat the ligaments and they would be fine. Once the disease starts getting some mileage on it, however, there are lots of other things that, that basically uh, turn into lives of their own, meaning there are problems that exist because of the CCI, but now are separate. Meaning if you fix the CCI, they'll still be there. That's such a great point to make that when you address these issues sooner rather than later and don't play the I hope it'll go away game, uh, smaller problems usually get better uh, because they require smaller treatments. When you wait, when you delay, when they get worse, unfortunately, when it doesn't go away and it often doesn't, uh, then you're dealing with longer recovery times and typically more expensive, not just a procedure, but follow up care as well. Okay, Lindsay is sharing, uh, she's experiencing numbness and tingling in all, well, I'll say in all four arms and legs. <laughs> I'll assume two arms, two legs uh, overnight. Lindsay, thank you for sharing that. Um, and uh, as you can see, a neck issue can affect legs. Uh, to a lot of people that sounds crazy, but to those that understand how the body works, the brain coordinates all of the functions of the body, including the legs. Um, and so in another case, that makes perfectly logical sense. Do you want to comment on that at all, Doc? Yeah, absolutely. We see all four extremity numbness tingling in a lot of patients uh, because if you've got issues up here with the spinal cord or the covering of the spinal cord is getting banged into, you can see all four extremity issues. Yeah. And uh, here we go. We got Kelsey explaining, uh, sharing that she's got clogged ears. Um, and so another example of it's my, not my ear, it's my neck. It's all connected. It'll be, it'll be the mind that one was, hear us say. Good. And that one was on the, uh, was on, uh, our questionnaire as well. Uh, fluid in the ears is, is on there. So that's, that's one shared not only by you, but by other people as well. Our friend Stacy is sharing, uh, she missed the beginning of the live stream, but uh, she wants to add systems, her symptoms, excuse me. She has 40 symptoms and would love to add to your list if it could help others. So segmental spinal myoclonus, eyelid spasm, hyperventilating, deep raspy voice, electric shocks in teeth, tears pour from eyes, sneezing fits, tinnitus, blurry vision, intestinal issues, shoulder, thoracic spine pain, cervicogenic pain, trap pain, vertigo, nausea, electric shocks in teeth, trigeminal nerve pain, and on and on and on. Um, so, so we've got a, a reasonable number of those on here uh, right now at that link. Um, the, the ones that we don't have as much of are things like the electrical shocks and the teeth. Um, you know, we do have TMJ on there. We do have facial pain on there. Um, so, uh, so thanks for, for letting me know that. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to add a few more. She added here. Oh, oh, oh yeah. Also, uh, asymmetric muscle atrophy, entire body head to toe, 
and list to one side when walking with pressure on the top of the big toenails. Okay, Stacy, thank you for sharing. Very much appreciate that. Uh, Naomi goes to say uh, a weird one that she's experiencing is one eye often oozes fluid. Uh, I think the gland that affects tears goes through the C1, C2 area, she comments. Interesting. Yeah, now interestingly, that one was on here. Um, and I didn't have a context for it, so I think I got I got it lumped in with another one. Um, but that's an interesting one that I've heard a few times that there's tear duct issues, basically. Yeah. All right. Charlotte is uh, sharing. Bear with me here, Doc. Here's how here it goes. I've lost a lot of sensation of my upper muscles on my left side, which immediately got better after manual traction. So must be some connection. Have you heard it before? Could it be due to compression of nerve roots at C1, C2? She goes on to say, I got temporarily paralyzed on my left side due to my injury approximately a year after the accident. And it actually happened after manual traction. It was recommended surgery by one doctor, but since CCI is not a diagnosis here in Sweden, the neurosurgeon didn't do anything. I made it back by intense PT training for five months, but have a scary, uh, sore back now. I'm not sure what that says, back now. Um, thought the paralysis was a sign that my injuries were too bad for stem cells, but considering how well it got, I hope there is still hope for me with stem cells and not fusion. What is your thought? Yeah, so we do see people with, with weakness uh, on one side of their body. Um, now, sometimes in the arm, that can be due to the fact that if the upper neck is off, then the patient tends to tilt their head. And then once they tilt their head, they kind of tilt their body back to right the visual field. Um, and so that can cause things like thoracic outlet syndrome on the high side here, where the scalenes get too tight and the nerves that go through the brachial plexus get irritated and cause uh, issues in the arm can also obviously lead to compression of nerve roots on this side of the lower neck, or there can be disc bulges there independently that are doing that or made worse by any of this. So uh, definitely something to, to look at, but a, but a fairly common um, symptom complex. You know, if you look at the symptoms that are, that are listed online at, at the link that we put here, you know, you've got things like clumsy hands there, um, myoclonic jerking, uh, heavy arms. Um, so these are dropping things. So these are sort of within the, the spectrum of the complaints that we captured uh, for CCI. And, her, and Charlotte's question is, uh, you know, based on what she wrote here, do you have hope that stem cells could be helpful for her? Yeah, I, I think Charlotte, I'd have to see your imaging and review your individual case to make that statement. Uh, but happy to do that. We can do that over a telemedicine Zoom link. And that way I can have a better idea of what's going on with you. Um, and just to remind everybody, you know, we do have this symptom list here. It's at the link that's in the comments. So if you find that link, click on that link, you'll be able to see what we're looking at as we talk about this as to the common symptoms of, of CCI. Okay. We have Lorien Sunshine why are that? I hope I said that correctly. I've had many of the typical symptoms of CCJ instability, but one of the craziest is the effect it seems to have on my jaw. I've had TMJ issues for many years, but after being rear-ended in 2019, the TMJ symptoms have become out of control. I have speech issues, ringing ears, jaw joint subluxation, and the urge to grind became a 24-hour thing and caused a lot of dental damage. The only thing that has kept me stable is my upper cervical chiropractor and cranial sacral therapist. Have you seen other CCJ patients with jaw issues? Yeah, it's really common. It's on our list here. So if you click on that link, you'll see that TMJ is on there. And it's a pretty common one. So the reason why that generally happens is because uh, when you lose the ability to stabilize the upper neck, uh, what happens is these, these strap muscles up front get involved. And once they get involved, uh, you're basically using the jaw muscles as a, as a secondary neck stabilizer. 
So if you clench your jaw like that, you can make some stability happen in your upper neck. Um, and then they get overworked because they're not designed for that. So then at night, you, you tend to brux or have bruxism where you're clenching and destroying your teeth because you've got muscles that are way, way, way overworked um, and they're in spasm uh, at night because that's the only time they get a break all day uh, because they are acting as a secondary stabilizer for the upper neck. So TMJ is very, very common. And then the other thing we need to know is whether or not we need to treat the TMJ at the same time or whether it's gonna go away once we help stabilize the upper neck. And many times we'll end up treating the TMJ at the same time. Such an important thing. And, and that's very much, if you're paying attention to the nuances here, you'll notice that the, the philosophy is to find the cause of the problem and many of the symptoms can clear up secondary to addressing the cause. And that's a different philosophy than chasing the symptoms. And that's an important part to just understand. If you wanna know how doctors think, especially holistic doctors, that is the philosophy. How do we get through all of the sort of uh, distractions to find out really what is causing these other things to happen? All right, let's say uh, Rachel asks, what other types of regenerative medicine may work synergistically to enhance the effects of the PICL? Not quite sure what's being asked there, so maybe ask it in more detail. Um, uh, we use bone marrow concentrate and PRP because that's the thing we found the most uh, successful for ligament healing. Uh, so I'm not quite sure what's being asked. So maybe ask that one a different way. Rachel, please ask that one again. Of course, you know, we're here for you. Um, Stacy is saying that she didn't see the link, but she'd like to provide it. I'm not sure if that was the link to the blog or the link to perhaps taking the survey. Um, but we can follow up if there's a way that she might be able to participate with her symptoms in the survey. Yeah, so the survey was actually done in our office um, on good old fashioned paper. And these were people who were um, already screened as having CCI because the biggest problem with doing an online survey is that you're gonna get people who definitely have C CCI, people who may have CCI, people who probably don't have CCI but think they do. And it's going to really create a very uh, confusing symptom picture. Um, hence, we wanted to make sure that, th that we had confirmed CCI enough to bring them out for treatment before we ask these symptom questions. Right on. All right. Lorian, I see you saw TMJ on the uh, cloud. So uh, too late to ignore your question, but thanks for looking at it. Uh, LOL as well. All right, Damien, thank God it is Monday. I agree. We love doing our program. And Appreciate you joining us every week. Uh, what are your top three sources of information, such as journals, articles, peer reviews, and so forth? Damien uses PubMed, uh, but he heard that uh, up to date to be too very educational. I'm not sure what those typos mean exactly, but uh, what, what are your favorite ways to uh, get great sources of information, Doc? Yeah, so I, I, I do a lot of uh, searching in PubMed. PubMed's a great one. Um, obviously, you've got to kind of screen what you're looking for and hone in on, on what you're looking for. You know, conferences for me is another good one because you'll tend to see things before they're published uh, or submitted in PubMed. Realize that once a doctor submits something, it can take a year or longer sometimes for it to go through the process of review back and forth, back and forth, and then another several months before it actually shows up in PubMed. So at conferences, you can generally see things that are well uh, prior to being public. So you kind of get the latest and, and the greatest. Um, and then we've got, I've got an extensive you know, co connection uh, with many, many doctors who've been doing regenerative medicine uh, for a long time. And we share information back and forth uh, through LinkedIn groups, other groups, discussion groups, uh, et cetera, sometimes even just email as new things are found out or suspected. So those are, the, those are the sources I tend to use. PubMed's a big one, but uh, you're right. PubMed tends to, to you know, really trail what's really happening on a day-to-day -day basis, sometimes by one to three years, depending on, on what's being studied. All righty. Thank you for the question. We've got Kelsey asking, uh, I have a heavy arm and suspect TOS, thoracic outlet syndrome. Uh, is that treatable with PICL or, C or for CCI, or does it require a different injection? 
Yeah, so if there's thoracic outlet syndrome, what that means is that the nerves in here, the scalings are getting compressed and irritated, and that can either lead to a heavy arm or it could lead to numbness or tingling in the arm. Uh, and that's the brachial plexus as it goes through the scalings or sometimes uh, being irritated by the first rib there. So, uh, so yes, that probably needs to be treated separately at the same time as the upper neck ligaments uh, in general. Now, sometimes we'll, we'll start treating the upper li neck ligaments first, see if that goes away. If it does, then great. If it doesn't, we'll go back and treat that directly. And usually that's a scaling hunter dissection uh, is how that's treated. So uh, that's generally how we deal with that. All righty. Thank you for your question, uh, Kelsey. And uh, if you'd like more information, you can reach out to the Centennial Schultz Clinic. The education department, the education center is happy to answer more questions. And if you'd like to schedule an appointment uh, to have that PICL and thoracic outlet treatment, uh, they can help you there as well. Our friend Roger asks, can you explain the relationship between which ALAR ligament that has been torn and which side demonstrates more C1, C2 overhang? For example, if the right ALR is torn, would there be more overhang when the head is tilted to the right? Yeah, so it's the opposite um, ALR to the overhang. So if there's overhang to the right, so you're bending your head to the right, there's overhang to the right, it's the left ALR and, and vice versa. Um, and if you look at how it's all put together relative to the C1-C2 joint, um, you'll see that that makes sense. Initially, it doesn't sound like it should make sense. It sounds like it should be this, the one on the same side, but it's actually the one on the opposite side. There you go. Reminding me of my days back in uh, school. All right. Uh, Stacy says, uh, for those with jaw pain, I have the opposite of TMJ. Chewing actually relieves her jaw and facial pain. That's an interesting phenomenon. Your thoughts on that, Doc? Yeah, so realize if, if the... So as I said, if you um, you're, you can use these jaw muscles as a secondary stabilizer for the upper neck. Uh, another example is you can also use the upper trapezius muscles as a secondary stabilizer. So many times if CCI patients lift their arms like this to do something overhead, their CCI will get worse because they, you can't use your upper traps to stabilize when they're being used to lift your arms. Same thing with the jaw. Uh, I would suspect that for some people who have very strong muscles up in here, that chewing might actually activate that stability effect in the upper neck, um, and that might help quite a bit. Uh, now, for most people, eventually those muscles are going to get worn out, and it's going to go the other direction towards TMJ, muscle overload, spasm at night, bruxism, things like that. But I don't doubt that some people have strong enough muscles up here where they can compensate. All righty. Lena Zelensky asks, I'm very interested in PICL, but I'm worried about mixed information that I read. I read an article on stem cells and long-term problems, and the article mentioned possible tumor growth after stem cell treatment. What is your opinion on this? Is PICL safe in this regard? Thank you. Yeah, so I think what you're, what you're reading, and listen, I've been doing this been using bone marrow concentrate on ligaments longer than any human being on earth. Um, and we've published the, the world's largest uh, study on using bone marrow concentrate, culture expanded cells, adipose on musculoskeletal issues uh, with the, the longest follow up uh, on earth so far. And we didn't see any tumor formation. And there's a reason why. If you look at the, the data on tumor formation, it's with teratomas which happen with embryonic stem cells. So the job of an embryonic stem cell is to build a baby, right? So sometimes they will try to build a baby. Um, so you might, a teratoma is this weird sort of tumor where you can see a little bit of a tooth, some hair, some skin, intestinal tissue, all in the same tumor. Um, and it happens because the, the embryonic stem cells are trying to build a baby. They're trying to do what they're, they've been programmed to do. Now, not so with mesenchymal stem cells from bone marrow, because those are the cells, for instance, that heal your bones if you have a fracture or if you tear a, a ligament uh, and there's joint damage, you have bleeding into the joint uh, that damages the ligament, the cartilage. There, the cells are going to help repair that ligament, repair that cartilage. 
Uh, and we don't see tumors in those sorts of natural processes at all. Uh, obviously, it would be extremely rare to see a tumor in, in someone who's trying to heal a bone, but it's the bone marrow mesenchymal stem cells that are doing that. Um, so no, we don't see tumor growth with uh, bone marrow concentrate or the use of bone marrow concentrate. Uh, we've documented that, others have documented that. Uh, Felipe Hernigau actually has a nice big study specifically on that topic um, of neoplasm. So I think our study had 3,000 procedures in it. I think Felipe Hernigau's had 1,800. Um, so between those two studies, pretty certain that we're not gonna see any tumor growth. Great question, thank you for asking. And these nuances are where it matters. There's a lot of misinformation out there and a lot of partial information that leaves a lot of room for misinterpretation, confusion, just like this. And this is why you wanna make sure you're here asking these questions. Uh, and Damien is great at asking questions, so let's keep him going. Uh, his question now is how many body parts can you examine for an initial consultation? Yeah, I mean, that just comes down to obviously time, but you know, it's pretty common for me to see patients where I am looking at um, five, six, seven, eight. It's very different than the type of evaluation you would have, let's say, in orthopedic surgery office, right? For orthopedic surgery office, you go in for your knee, they're only going to look at your knee. I've got my shoulder too, let's do that next time. Uh, that's not what we do. We kind of do the opposite of that. My goal is to take a look at everything that's involved. Now, Every once in a while, it's not possible to do that because there's too much going on. But 95% of the time, I can get to every problem that they've discussed and create a problem list. Now, it may not be appropriate in that person to treat everything out of the gate. Maybe you want to do some things now and some things later. But, um, you know, the goal is to try to look at everything. There we go. All righty. Thank you. Uh, Lena is also asking, for mild cases of CCI, could PRP only um, without PICL be a solution? It could. I, I think the biggest problem there comes down to if we're going to take the risk of going in through this new anterior approach, um, good news is that risk is less, much, much less than fusion uh, because we've done 300 plus of those procedures with no serious life-changing complications. And had we done 300 fusions, we would have had probably one death um, and at least 50 to 70 serious life-changing complications. So it's much safer than fusion. But if we're going to go in there and take that additional risk, um, my overall sense is you want to put your best foot forward and the best foot forward we have uh, for ligament healing is bone marrow concentrate. Now, once we get down the road, let's say we've done a thousand of these procedures and we've had no issues or problems uh, other than things that can be solved here and there in, in a couple of days or a couple of weeks, uh, then, then we might look at doing that for the less severe cases. But for right now, if we're going to take the additional risk of going in uh, through this novel approach, we want to put our best foot forward because uh, I want as few failures as possible for taking that risk. Absolutely makes sense. Uh, Stacy is asking, uh, I'm a PICL patient, would love for the clinic to send her a link if, uh, if you would like to add her symptoms uh, to the list. Is the study closed or is that something that would make sense for her to contribute to? Yeah, so Stacy, you may have already filled out this questionnaire. Not 100% sure. Uh, it's the one that we were giving out to new PICL patients. Sometimes we were catching it up as we instituted it on people that were coming in for the second or third one. So you may have filled it out already. I'm not 100% sure, but you can certainly reach out to me via email and I can check to see if we have one on you. And if we do, then great. If not, then we'll, we'll get you one to fill out. Outstanding. Thank you so much, Stacy, for uh, con contributing. Uh, Rachel's following up on her earlier question that uh, we asked her for more info. So she said, uh, might something like peptides work synergistically with the PICL? This was the other regenerative uh, medicine procedure. So something like peps pe excuse me, peptides, um, is that possible to affect, improve the effects of the PICL? Yeah, it might. It's just we don't know much about this at this point. So, for instance, BPC-157 
is a common peptide uh, that's currently being promoted as helping with things like tendon repair. Um, and you know, I looked at the, the small in vitro study they did on BP157 with mesenchymal stem cells. Basically, the results they got were very similar to the study we did on PRP and mesenchymal stem cells. They weren't any better than that. Um, so my overall sense is we don't know anything about this BP, BPC157 and the safety of using it uh, on actual real patients. Uh, we've got now dozens and dozens of clinical trials, randomized controlled trials on the use of PRP. So why take the additional risk of the BPP, BPC1557 when I can get the same results by adding some PRP into the bone marrow? And PRP is a known quantity. There's been lots of research on it. Um, so right now, the additional risk for me doesn't make sense based on the results I've seen for that peptide. Um, now, at some point in the future, when we actually have some real clinical research on this, um, and that clinical research gives doctors like me a comfort level, then we may want to start using it. But just be a little careful, because this stuff is being, we don't even know that what you're buying has BPC, BPC 157 in it, meaning that we did this study about five, six years ago, where we, we had companies selling um, vials of things like transforming growth factor beta, uh, which is a really nice uh, growth factor. It's not FDA approved for human use, but they claim to be selling it. Um, so we tested these vials. There was no TGF beta in these vials, um, at least uh, nothing down to picogram range, which is a, a billionth of a gram. So, uh, so be a little careful. We don't even know what's in these vials. That's what I may have the science team do here at some point. In fact, I had asked our science team to research whether or not uh, we can get an, uh, an inexpensive assay for BPC-157, it's called an ELISA, to see uh, if we can test some of these products to see what's in them, because they're not regulated as, as drugs, they're regulated as, as a supplement. And so I would be very cautious to even accept that there's BPC-157 in these things at the extent they are until the, our science team actually tests it. Uh, Cause I don't see anyone testing any of this stuff. This is all pro sales and no one's looking at the other consumer side. Buyer beware. You gotta make sure you are working with uh, people uh, and places that you trust. So that's uh, an important part of all of this. Okay, Naomi Payne says, I'm 14 weeks post PICL. Uh, PICL number one that is. Dr. Schultz also did posterior and nerve hydro dissection, I believe that says. I have had great results, but find my very upper neck muscles are stiff on rotation. My adjustments are holding very well, and I use moist heat a few times a day. I'd like to get a massage to try to release those muscles. Is a massage okay? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, this is where I think all instability patients have to be a little careful because Sometimes you need that muscle tension to provide stability. So I think it'd be worth, certainly worth to try. Um, go and try to get a massage in that area. Uh, number one, see if it helps your symptoms. And number two, does it, does it put you into feeling unstable? Um, because I've seen that many times with instability patients. They'll, they'll have some muscle spasm. Frequently they'll do a massage or they'll do Botox to try to relax those muscles. And that kind of sends them the opposite direction of expected because they need that muscle spasm. So I would certainly give it a try um, and see how that goes. And if it helps you, by all means. Uh, but if you tend to regress, realize that you may need the muscle spasm right now to provide that stability. Always fascinating to see what the body does and why. Uh, Damien follows up asking, can needle barbitage be an effective treatment to address large bone spurs when the doctor, when the doctors don't have a 10x unit? Thank you in advance for answering my questions. Yeah, Damien, needle barbitage tends to work with very small bone spurs or calcifications within tendons. Um, it would be very, very hard to barbitage off a big bone spur on in something like the ankle joint uh, with needle barbitage. Uh, in fact, the only thing I, I have seen that can take off the larger spurs or medium to larger ones would be that 10X bone uh, system or bone needle, 
where the, the tip of that thing vibrates at ultrasonic levels. In addition, it's got an ability to constantly suck stuff out as it's broken up. Um, so both those would be important, right? The ability to break it down, the ability to suck it out right away. Um, and you don't really have that same level with needle barbitage. Great question. Thank you, Doc. Kelsey follows up, is loss of sensation over time at the top of the neck a symptom? Yeah, that's a really good one to bring up because that brings up dermatomes. So we have this concept that in the body, each uh, spinal nerve is supposed to innervate a certain part. So the back of the, the top of the head would be C2, the back of the neck is C3, uh, C4, C5, C6, 7, 8, T1, T2. Um, so where it's going numb gives you a really nice clue about which nerve is involved. And in that case, uh, probably C3, but could also be encroaching on the C2 area. So either C2 or C3, which would both be nerves that we would be suspect or that we would suspect would be irritated. So those spinal nerves may need to be treated at the same time, or that might go away uh, once the area is stabilized. But that's an important clue as to which spinal nerves are, are getting irritated. Great question. Thank you for asking, Kelsey. Stacy follows up with uh, the question, when you evaluate a patient's diagnostic tests, do you scrutinize the actual imaging or more rely on radiolog radiology reports? Oh, yeah. I, I never read radiology reports. They're worthless. Uh, <laughs> now, it's, it, it, I don't want to say that because they're not worthless. They're helpful for me in ruling out super duper uncommon things that I might not see all the time that a radiologist might, like a small little tumor that's hanging out someplace. So from that standpoint, I think they're valuable. But in this area, um, uh, unless there's a super specialized radiologist, like Dave Harshfield is a good example. Uh, we use a guy locally by the name of Gorchi, who's really excellent, who really knows this area. Um, then it can be helpful. Then, you know, we have someone whose eyes are on it who can see things because they're looking at this stuff all day. Um, so another example is Scott Rosa in New York. Uh, he can be very, very helpful in this kind of stuff. But for the average radiologist, I mean, this is just not something they look at. In fact, if I were to ask the average radiologist, where's the ALAR ligament and find it on this image, most of them would have to think twice or look it up or really cog you know, cogitate on the concept of where this is and, and how it should appear on various images, because it's just not something they look at uh, all day. So for the most part, not very helpful. We look at all of our own films, obviously. But if there is somebody who does focus on this area uh, all day, every day, then it can be very helpful. And, you know, Dave Harshfield, uh, a local gentleman that we use by the name of Dr. Gorgi and Scott Rosa are three people that come to mind who know enough about this area where if they said, hey, take a look at this, I would say, oh, yeah, I'm definitely going to look at that area. Right on. All right. Bear with me. This is a little bit of a long one. So let's see if it gets on the screen. There we go. Uh, Justin Eddy asks, after my neck injury, I began to experience headaches, neck pain, and muscle stiffness. These symptoms were trying but didn't stop me in my tracks like the neurological symptoms did. Blurry vision, brain fog, extreme fatigue, et cetera, became debilitating. I suspected that these symptoms were caused by my neck injury, but was told by multiple doctors, including neurologists and functional neurologists, chiropractors, that this was not possible. It took me 17 years to finally get to this diagnosis. How can a fairly straightforward mechanical injury be so misunderstood by specialists? Why do neurologists not realize that neck injuries can cause neurological symptoms? Are you optimistic that this condition will gain widespread recognition in the medical community in the future? What a great question. Yeah, I mean, this is, Justin, this is very similar to an orphan diagnosis, right? If you look at orphan drugs through the FDA, you know, generally we're talking about a condition that affects, let's say, tens of thousands of people maybe. Um, and CCI is kind of like that. I mean, it's common enough where it's out there and you will run into it at some point in your career if you see neck pain patients, maybe several times. You may or may not know what it is. But if you compare how common it is to something like a disc herniation or to something like an injured facet joint or um, something that doctors see every day who deal with the spine, 
um, it, it's not very common. So it's maybe got a hundredth or a thousandth uh, uh, the prevalence of those things. So I think that's the problem is you, it's, doctors don't see this stuff all the time. I think as more gets published on it, you'll see more doctors who kind of put it in the list of things they're looking for. But the average neurologist, for example, remember, I, I think I blogged on this, neurologists come from the internal medicine tree, uh, part of the tree, not, not the 3D analysis of structures part of the tree. And what I mean by that is if you're from the internal medicine part of the tree, you're taught how to do drugs. Um, and anything that is biomechanical is really not in your uh, parlay, right? You know, physical medicine, rehab, radiologist, orthopedic surgeons, they're, they're from the other side of the tree where they're looking how the biomechanics work. How do things connect? How do they move? Uh, what's normal? What's abnormal? That's not the neurologist part of the tree. Um, so for this kind of stuff, you know, regrettably, neurologists are absolutely the wrong people to see because they're not even from the right part of the tree to recognize what this might be. It just They just don't have a box for it. Uh, they're looking for a medication that they can write you. Uh, often the problem is, uh, we, you know, they, they say if, uh, if you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Uh, you know, part of widespread adoption, I believe, has everything to do with do doctors have a way to earn money by finding it and fixing it? Uh, if they don't, they might not find it so quickly. Um, and that's often, I think, part of the motivation for people to learn what they learn. And unfortunately, there are trends and we've gotten super specialized that I think most lose the forest through the trees, as they say. Uh, OK, we've got a few more left and uh, we're over time, but we'll stay with it. Stacy, when you evaluate oh, this was the one you said earlier, we just hear a second time. We already answered that. Sabina. Hello, Sabina. Can a lab created corrective mouthpiece designed by a neuromuscular dentist hurt the ligaments after PICL, or would that help realign the jaw and C1? 99% of dent dentists have no idea about CCI in the first place. Yeah, they don't. And I think, so if you look at what dental appliances are trying to do, there's a couple different things they're, they're trying to accomplish. Many times it's trying to get rid of destroying the teeth through bruxism. So sometimes it's a mouth guard that's positioning the jaw in such a way as to, to relax these muscles. Other times you can try to pull the jaw forward, for instance, if there's things like sleep apnea. Uh, other times you're trying to reposition the jaw to take weight off the TMJ or to give the TMJ a break. Now realize that the reason why the TMJ has a problem is because all of these anterior muscles are being used to stabilize the upper neck that, and that they're not designed to do that. So, you know, sometimes by using an oral appliance, it, it may not help. It might even go the opposite direction because they're not really trying to provide stability up here, which is what would be needed to solve the issue. They're just trying to get the TMJ a break. And your TMJ is being loaded because you need the stability that's coming from these front strap muscles. So I would be a little careful there to make sure that they know, your dentist knows what the goal is that's trying to be accomplished. All righty. We've got a few more from Stacy, and that should be it for our show today. Uh, she starts with, if PICLs have stabilized ALAR and transverse ligaments, but want to know, but want to know if... ALL and PLL ligaments are still unstable, what diagnostic test would be required? And she follows that up with, or any other ligaments as well. How do you test the ligaments? Yeah, so ALL and PLL. So ALL is the piece of duct tape on the front part of the spine. The PLL is the piece of duct tape on the back part of the spine. So uh, there, uh, that's where DMX can be very helpful. Uh, for instance, we just saw a woman uh, the other day, you know, uh, I probably set up something I shouldn't have, you know, because she, she got her head so far back that she, she looked like a, a Cirque du Soleil person. I mean, on the, on the DMX, I mean, I was uh, like, whoa, this is, this is amazing how far she got it back. Now, she doesn't really have classical HEDS, uh, she may have spine-related uh, laxity, but it was enough where in doing her bite and score and everything else, she didn't really meet that criteria 
where it's probably due to a stretch injury of the ALL, and it makes sense. She was in a surfing accident where her head got slammed into the sand. Uh, so, you know, she hyperextended and she hurt that. So DMX is a good way to look at that. You could also look at it on uh, flexion extension uh, radiographs. You can also look at it on flexion extension MRI. Um, and with her, we're bringing her in to look at her ALL under ultrasound. We can't see the PLL under ultrasound, but we can see the ALL very nicely under ultrasound. Um, you could also try to do a very high field MRI for the PLL, something like a three Tesla closed war magnet, uh, where you're trying to see if you can visualize it to see if it's been uh, disrupted. All right, thank you, Stacy. She follows up with one more question that asks, have you considered prescribing CT and getting the computer program to turn it into a 3D image of C-spine to look for areas of compression. Yeah, I mean, it's easy to get a 3D reconstructed CT these days. Uh, the biggest problem with CT is that it's got an immense uh, radiation dose. So, you know, we're talking 100 plus chest X-rays for a CT scan. Um, so for that, I think, you know, doing a, a upper high quality upper cervical MRI uh, um, or a, a seated MRI or standing MRI would probably be better um, just because of the immense dose that CT uh, uh, or radiation that CT provides and realize that we might have to take several of them through this time. So we don't want to expose someone to several hundred chest X-ray radiation doses uh, if there's another way to get around that. All righty. And Sabina follows up with, uh, her dentist, my dentist doesn't understand CCI despite sending him all of your information and her diagnosis. Uh, and that's not uncommon. It's just a different way of training. It's almost a different language. Uh, the words sound the same, but they have very different meaning and interpretation. And therefore, they know what to do or have no idea what to do based on their training more than the actual words. Do you care to comment as we close on this today? Yeah, and I think that that's actually, that's actually probably an opportunity to educate uh, TMJ dentists on CCI because they really, they don't get exposed to it very much. There's no one out there talking about it in their world, uh, but they are the ones that would see these folks with TMJ and neck pro upper neck problems who could hopefully say, huh, maybe this one's different than all of the other TMJ folks that have walked in over the last couple months. And that's why they're not responding. So that, that would actually be a really good place to start educating medical providers. I mean, I'm already in the process of educating a lot of the chiropractors who see these patients. Um, family doctors are harder to get to and they don't see enough of these. Um, but if you really look at one of the places they might end up, they certainly might end up in a TMJ office. And there are lots of people looking to, uh, to learn about these topics, and this is the place to send them. Um, and I guess my comment would be to Sabina, and, and I'm curious for yours too, Doc, and is that you know, when educating any kind of doctor, chiropractor, medical doctor, osteopaths, whatever it may be, uh, would you comment on the fact that different doctors come about these things different ways? There are some doctors that get insulted when their patients bring ideas to them because the doctor's kind of think they know it all. Uh, and then there's other doctors that actually get curious when patients bring them information that they're unaware of. And they go, wow, I didn't know that. I'd love to learn more. Do you want to comment on that before we kind of close up for today? Yeah, you know, listen, I, you know, sometimes as the doctor, it can be frustrating when people bring you, you know, too much stuff. But for the most part, it's a net positive, uh, especially when they are um, exposing you to things you've never heard of before or things that you might have heard of way distant your medical training, but they've not been in the front of your mind in a very, very long time. So I think, you know, patients trying to educate uh, their doctors is a good thing. Um, and then, you know, also, listen, I'm happy to talk to any of these uh, folks that are out there um, if they're seeing my patients to try to educate them on this. Sometimes if I give them a call, it's a little different than if the patient is, is putting something in front of them. Um, or, as I said, you know, trying to find national TMJ organizations that we can connect with, because there's certainly a percentage of those patients, it's a small percentage, but it's there, that have CCI and instead are getting treated for TMJ. 
That is a critical point to all of this. Of course, uh, we'll close up by saying Stacy says thank you. Uh, we'll close by saying thank you to all of you. Um, and as Dr. Centeno said, you know, there are doctors, organizations, groups, clubs, private Facebook groups, whatever it may be, that are always looking for more information. Um, and Dr. Centeno being a pioneer and really being focused on helping all of you with this condition specifically, uh, as you can see, our, our normally 30 minute show oftentimes goes 60, sometimes 90 minutes on this one topic alone. So let me invite all of you, if you've got doctors, if you've got people you know in different groups, if you've got just a friend or family member, please ask them if they're curious to learn more. Some will go, no, I know everything in their own way. And others will say, actually, I am. That sounds fascinating. I've not been exposed to that before. Where can I learn more? Damien, in fact, asked that earlier today. And the place to send them is to this show. It could be to set up a consultation with Dr. Centeno by contacting the Centeno Schultz Clinic and setting up a telehealth appointment if it's for a specific person with a specific condition. Um, we do have groups of other doctors that we bring together to sort of meet and greet to learn about what each other does and to really build connection with practices so ultimately we can all do what we are here to do, which is to help you. Help you, your friends, your family members, others who are suffering from these conditions and are searching for help, who to trust, where to go, what to do, and hopefully you found this place to be home for that information. Roger says thank you. Again, we say thank you. The best way to say thank you to us is to share this with other people. So if you want to click the share button down below, you can share it with everybody that you know on Facebook. If you want to type their name in the comments below, that should bold and that would then notify them that this is here. Or you can write an email or you can do your own Facebook Live or you can leave your own comments on the value you get by having access to, I say it over and over again, really the world's foremost expert, Dr. Chris Centeno, on this specific topic itself. So, Doc, uh, CCI, we went over again, but uh, let me ask you to just close today's show before we uh, wrap it up. Yeah, so so listen, uh, CCI symptoms are um, usually within a you know, small group of things uh, that are common to everybody, or not true, but common to the vast majority. Then you've got other things that, that are common in many people. And then other things that are only common in some people. So uh, the goal of creating the word cloud was to try to allow patients. So if you have patients out there who are part of the groups that you're on on Facebook, for example, show them the word cloud, uh, give them a link so they can click through and see the word cloud to see whether or not they match up in there. Or on the other hand, if you know, you're seeing that there's very, there are common other CCI symptoms that should be on the word cloud, then reach out to me um, so we can extend out our symptoms. Uh, but realize we're looking for people who we've confirmed have CCI, uh, not folks who think they may have CCI, just because we are trying hard to, to use those symptoms to guide the discussion between doctor and patient. There we go. Listen, thank you all for watching. We really appreciate it. We do what we do to be of service to you. As you know, we're here Mondays on the Centeno Schultz Clinic Facebook page. On Fridays, we'll see you on the Regenex Facebook page. Between now and then, I want all of you to stay well, be kind. Thanks for watching, and please share this with those people you know should be watching. Thanks for watching, everyone. See you Friday.